houses where they have you know put together a really good uh, presentation one of the largest it conferences in sri lanka so which is very ex exciting and uh, just after the lunch uh, so i hope uh, i won't make you sleep uh, one hour uh, i want to make this session a more interactive one where you can ask any questions and then you know we can build the con uh, conversation uh, on top of it rather than like me talking uh, one one hour at stretch so uh, today i'm i'm planning to discuss about uh, 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 devops a study in devops broken walls and emerging bridges that's why, why uh, that's how i wanted to call it uh, i will explain why throughout my session so uh, first of all uh, i want to uh, i want to discuss more on uh, what devops is uh, before that we need to identify why we needed to have a uh, new practices new set of uh, new way of working as devops the uh, the first thing is like uh, in traditional uh, software industry if you have been in uh, waterfall uh, software development uh, companies waterfall software development projects if you have been in you would realize the pain that uh, people are getting going through when we are trying to deliver the software on time the biggest uh, bottleneck was if we we gather months uh, we gather the requirements months and then you know we come up with uh, some sort of a understanding on the software and then we started to build it in a waterfall method and then we deliver it after another years time yeah pretty much the entire uh, crowd entire uh, community here is here are like now uh, moved to uh, agile software development so the so the benefit of uh, this uh, agile software development practices are we were able to deliver software on time and basically the most important thing is we were able to so slowly evolve a product into its desired state for example uh, unlike in a waterfall method where we do all the development and release it at once after say every 6 months or maybe yearly we were gradually releasing in uh, agile practices in every Uh, iteration you should be ready with a, uh, at least uh, shippable set of code where that can add value to the custom so small incremental changes were introduced in agile practices so that is the uh, biggest advantage that we got out of this uh, agile practices when these development teams are you know uh, pushing smaller changes to the production environment they were always changing the production environment and introducing smaller smaller features to the product on the other hand traditional system administrators operation engineers network engineers dbas were having so many issues because their focus was not on changing the software rapidly so with this movement change with this paradigm shift change in agile environment the biggest problem that the industry faced was the environment instability production environments were not stable due to many reasons every time we introduce a change to the production environment every time we introduce a new feature to the our product every time we uh, introduce a bug fix to our product things are getting breaked if you if you change if you change the network uh, card of a server the production environment get get breaks so if you take the number of production incidents that you are face facing most of them are occurred due to changes that's because the one part of the world world was agile and the other part of the world was not agile they were doing their old traditional sys admin work when the agile teams were having a shippable set of code after every iteration we were not able to successfully deploy it into the production environment because the other part of the world was not ready to accept that the other part of the world is the operation folks uh, people who manage the uh, production environment so that is the Uh, that is the biggest problem that we were solving with this devops practices so with devops breaking down breaking down the wall of confusion between development and operation and extending agile practices and values from the development to the operations which is very important in uh, delivering the software on time so we need to you know extend our agile practices into the uh, operations world as well so i want to uh, explicitly mention one thing uh if you if you if you are only building a product and you hand it over and wash your hands after that then sometimes these concepts might not uh, make big sense but if it is software as a service 
if you are providing software as a service and if you are owning the entire support cycle of a software which creates uh, which gives a lot of value uh, to organization if when when it, with these concepts like devops so the other thing is uh, automated uh, uh, configuration management tools like chef puppet uh, using configuration management tool is also one key aspect of devops in modern uh, world the you know, provisioning infrastructure is easy but compared to like 5 6 maybe 10 years back if you want to add new service to your product what will what you have to do you have to go through all sort of hassle like you have to get uh, quotations for the servers select the best price price and get the servers into the data center and install it and have them configured and then in this deploy your production into the deploy a code into the production environment which which creates uh, a lot of uh, issues when we are trying to deliver on time so that because of that this infrastructure as uh, as a code concept came into play with the cloud environment whether you are have your own cloud whether you have a private cloud or whether you are using amazon rackspace whatever your cloud provider is if the if you can convert if you can convert your infrastructure into a code then things are getting very easy if in a in a in a configuration file if you can mention the number of cpus memory uh, os version and uh, uh, the binary version rbm version sysctl configurations uh, or or so swap size all these details of a server if you can put it into a into a configuration file then you can create the identical servers using that template so which will give us uh, benefits when we are trying to you know quickly spin up the servers so that is also one uh, devops movement so in this uh, slide that i am talking about uh, four major movements that uh, created devops so infrastructure as a code is one of them i think uh, in my in in your in previous presentation janaka was also you know touching a little bit about uh, infrastructure code as as code so uh, the other one is building continuous integration and continuous delivery pipelines so uh, which will automatically to test and push the changes and uh, we need to wire the uh, security and other required compliance testing into this pipeline so continuous integration and continuous deployment are very key thing key things in uh, in uh, devops so uh, i just want to you know know how you guys are practicing this uh, continuous integration can you raise if you are practicing continuous integration within your organizations can you raise your hands okay very it, it's still it's very uh, few few uh, it, it's the nature of sri lankan industry we are still you know in the early days of continuous integration but as an industry in sri lanka we have to you know evolve in evolve to uh, practice the continuous integration in every every day a developer can commit to the uh, software repository with his changes and integrate it with the code that is that is really good that is what we call the continuous integration and then that continuous integration needs to happen every developer's changes needs to submit it to the commit to the uh, main line so which is which is really important and on the other hand continuous delivery and continuous deployment when you are deploying the code into the production environment or pre production environment or your regression test environments nightly build environment however the name you call it when you are deploying the code into the environment it should be automated even when you are provisioning the environment for a, for your testing that should also be automated so that that is continuous deliver continuous deployments and then uh, the other major movement here is uh, running experiments creating fast feedback loops and learning from failures so i will discuss more about uh, you know creating fast feedback loops in my next slides so uh, throughout this uh, agile throughout this uh, devops movements all uh, everything is targeted towards delivering software with quality and uh, with uh, with a with a with a very high quality and also deliver it within time so those are the main aspects that we are looking at uh, by implementing those uh, practices here so when you are implementing devops i would uh, I personally i like to use this uh, model which is uh, we call uh, camps model culture automation measurement and sharing so uh, if it is a very small organization a startup let's say if it is a startup you might have be having a developer who's doing who's talking to the uh, software who's talking to the customer himself 
or he might be doing the uh, production deployment as well, if it is a very smaller company. But if it is a medium to large scale companies, if uh, then there is a distinction between these functionalities. We have a separate department for operations and we have a separate departments for uh, development. There are people who develop the software and there are people who manage the software in the production environment. So because of those silos, it's really hard to implement DevOps practices within an organization. So first thing that we need to implement is culture. We should build a culture where operations and developments are working together in order to you know, deliver the best to their customers. So uh, instead of having silos, we are you know, building cross-functional teams to create software. So that, that is one uh, good ex uh, uh, thing uh, when it, with the DevOps. And uh, previously, uh, I think if you, uh, if you were a sysadmin in 10 years back, you would know this. Where the sys there was a time the sysadmins ruled the world. They have the production to uh, production access, and they have uh, you know they are the one who manage the production. So they consider themselves be kind kind of a privileged people. But now things have changed. Now there are environments. Uh, now there are environments where no ops are there. So operation folks are not there. It all done by developers. Developers have the access to the ultimate production environment as well. So they manage the production environment. So the things have changed, and uh, there are new roles have introduced into the organizations like DevOps engineer role. So the, all those things I will be planning to discuss. And the, this culture is really important because we need to build, a, we, 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 are, we are not, not implementing a, a procedure. We are not implementing a pra practice like ITIL here. We are implementing a new culture. If you take Facebook, Google, Amazon, all the Etsy, all those major companies in the world are now moved to uh, DevOps uh, practices. They are DevOps companies now. Uh, in my presentation, I will touch a little bit on uh, some of these social network engineering, uh, social network companies, how they have implemented their pipeline, how they, have delivered the, how they are delivering the software to the customer. So basically, uh, uh, it's all about creating a culture where operations and operation people and the development people are working closely together. And uh, the other important aspect is automation. With DevOps, we are expected to automate every repetitive task. Every repetitive task needs to be automated. So uh, I believe engineers should not waste time on doing repetitive tasks. Then he is not, he's not an engineer. If you are an engineer, engineer should automate everything because the engineering work is automation and execution work is just a script. So in modern world, if, if something is rep uh, repetitive, definitely I believe that needs to be automated. So automation is a key concept in uh, DevOps. You might have to uh, automate your delivery or deployment or continuous integration, your build creation, your test, acceptance test, unit test, whatever it is, everything needs to be automated in a DevOps environment. You, we might not be able to get there overnight, but slowly, gradually, we should come up with a way of doing it. And then sharing. Sharing is also one thing uh, where I talked about previously, where these, uh, how the operation folks needs to share their uh, experience and knowledge and feedback with the development teams as early as possible. So uh, I discussed this uh, in, my, in my previous slides as well. So, Continuous delivery goals are uh, low cycle time and high quality. Before that, continuous delivery is the backbone of DevOps. So uh, that's why I picked the continuous delivery part here. Continuity deliver, continuous delivery means like you deliver your software to the customer's hand safely with a high quality. So low cycle time is really important. If, if the development team takes two weeks to uh, uh, create, uh, come up with a new feature, and if it takes another two weeks to deploy it into the production environment, it's a waste. So we need to eliminate that waste by uh, doing various uh, things, including automation, which we are going to cover. So uh, that is one key aspect that we are looking for, slow so cycle time. And then high quality. We need to integrate the quality into every, hour st every step. So for example, uh, uh, if, you, if your product is supposed to you know, comply to any of any security uh, measurements that 
that is being introduced, then you need to integrate those security testing uh, into your deployment pipeline. Then, then what will happen is you can automatically get that security clearance in your pipeline itself. So, so quality, when it comes to quality, it, it, it might be having various non-functional requirements. Non-functional requirements should be there like uh, performance, you know, handling load, security. Many things can be covered. But ultimately, the goal is to have uh, a low cycle time and uh, with a high quality uh, products. So uh, I, a couple of sessions that I did in uh, Kalambu, uh, many presentations, I used this, uh, I used this uh, uh, picture because uh, this is the uh, picture of uh, Toyota, how they build their uh, cars. And they have a deployment pipeline, the Toyota belt. In their belt, how they build the cars is really fascinating. So there are many things that we can learn out of uh, lean organization like Toyota. If you happen to read about uh, how Toyota is manufacturing their uh, cars, it's, it's really fascinating. So they, they are line, their production line is very sophisticated, and they, the production line is always busy, and it's always delivering the cars to the, uh, you know, to the customers. So, so that, that, that pipeline is uh, it's concept of a lean and a Six Sigma concepts are there. So I just you know, uh, mentioned it he here in, to get a, a very good uh, uh, opening for what I'm talking about in deployment plan, deployment pipeline. So here I have mentioned a small uh, deployment pipeline, how we should uh, deploy and how should we should create a deployment pipeline. In initially, I believe every developer, sh every day, uh, at least every day, every developer every day at least once should commit to the uh, software repository on what they are uh, developing. And then once the commit happens, the compilation should happen. And then it will, it will verify whether you have any syntax errors or not. Then compilation will uh, automatically happen. And then unit test needs to be run against that uh, build. So the unit test coverage is really important. When you are developing softwares, unit test and unit test coverage is really important. So at least more than 90% of the unit test coverage will give us a good cl clarity on the code itself. Because uh, unit tests are basically they are to see whether code is behaving the way that uh, developer is intended to behave. So it's really important to have unit, unit test. In initial stage, when you commit to the software repository, after compilation, the unit test should happen. And then uh, stat static analysis checkers like Sona Cube needs to be integrated there. So the Sona, I just use a, tool, a sample tool there. For example, a tool like Sona Cube might give you a good visibility on the code whether there are duplicate lines or code coverage. Likewise, there are many aspects that it will measure. So, uh, uh, so initially, when you commit to the environment, all these compilation, unit test, and static channel analysis checkers should automatically run. And then uh, build installers should also happen. So once it is done, then it should be deployed into the next env in, in the next environment. Then you should have some, some sort of artifact whether it's a .so file, .jar file, .net assemblies, whatever it is, you will have something. You will have something that can be deployed so that you can get that deployable uh, artifact and then you need to employ, uh, implement it automatically. You need to deploy it into a next environment to do the automated acceptance testing. So acceptance test automation is also a really good thing, really important. It's very important in deployment pipeline. So when you automatically provision, automatically deploy to the environment, the acceptance test will tell you whether the business case is achieved through that code. If the business case is not achieved, then uh, we will be having issues. So in a deployment pipeline, next step should be to automatically uh, test this. And then uh, after that, it should go to a capacity testing. It should deploy it into another environment to do capacity testing. So the capacity testing is also need to be automated. You might not be able to 100% de uh, automate the entire capacity testing plan, or maybe in your acceptance test as well. But the more major part, portion of this testing needs to be automated. That is really a uh, good thing when you are deploying, when you are building a de proper deployment pipeline in a DevOps environment. And then uh, you might be having manual exploratory testing where you, you know, give a UAT environment to a customer, to customer to go there and feel about the product, and then they can you know, give their feedback. 
and then finally you can release to the production environment. So in uh, Velocity 2013, I had an opportunity to talk to uh, few, one of few guys in uh, one of the leading uh, social networking organization. So uh, the deployment pipeline which they have uh, built is really fascinating. So they, every, every developer, at least every day that they are committing to the main line. And like in the same way, it goes through different stages. These commits go through the different stages. For example, uh, if we, uh, if we have come up with a new feature, that feature is, feature is uh, tested in different environments using different criteria. And if there are any security conformances which we need to uh, imp integrate, all these things are also integrated into this environment as a test. So there, is no you know, there are no, peop no managers or no uh, executive folks coming and ask you uh, whether this test has this thing, whether this uh, build has this one, whether this will break, nobody will ask any questions because all those questions will be integrated into the pipeline as a test. So that is the most fascinating thing. So, so that uh, so, so the, that uh, software, uh, so that uh, social engineering organization, once they everything is done, they deploy initially to their own employees. They deploy the changes into their own employees their own uh, uh, accounts. So once the employees are you know, utilizing those features for some time, then they, will, they are uh, implementing it to the wider customers all over the globe. So it's, it's, uh, they, for ma many organizations, they have a sophisticated deployment pipeline. If you take Amazon, they hold a record uh, for the deployments. They do uh, every deployment in uh, 11 seconds, every 11 seconds that they are doing a deployment. So they hold a record. In Facebook, uh, they release twice a day. Many Google applications, they re release at least three, four uh, times a day, three, three, four times a week. How they do, how they release so fast? They release so fast because they have automated, sophisticated pipeline where every commit will traverse to the, uh, to the release state. For example, uh, you, might, you might not want to deploy the every commit into the production in environment itself. But ideally, every commit should go in this pipeline till the pre-production environment. That's, that's how it should work. Uh, in, in such way, you can uh, decide which final commit that I'm going to uh, put into the uh, production environment, which I'm talking about is uh, a kind of a very high level. Uh, sometimes you might feel uh, uh, it's really hard to achieve. Yes, of course, it's really hard to achieve because uh, uh, if you take Facebook, Google, Amazon, they are, they, those are different companies, and we are we are totally different companies. We are sometimes we only uh, work for a specific product, and we are not uh, working in a so software as a service method. So we are just uh, building the software and handing over the software to the client. So we might be different from them. So, so there are, there is an argument that some people are saying for startups, DevOps and continuous delivery is good. But for well-established organizations, it's hard. It's a myth. But how, why they say is there is a, lot, a huge amount of changes that we need to introduce to get to, get to this uh, level. You have to invest a lot of time to automate all the acceptance testing. You have to invest a lot of time on automating unit testing and coming up with unit testing. Because in, in, this, uh, in this type of environment, the quality engineer's role has drastically changed. Previously, the quality engineers were going through the systems and manually doing testing. But now, quality engineers are not there to just to do testing. Quality engineers are automation engineers. They can automate the uh, unit test. In, in some organizations, they have, uh, uh, while, the, while the case, while the user story is built by the, build, build by the developer, the quality engineer is creating the unit test parallelly. So that's how some companies are operating. In some organizations, they do not have different, different organizations like Dev and QA. They have one set of group engineers. They can do both. They can do Dev and QA. So those are, they, they, uh, those, there are many startup companies like that, and they have gone very far with these uh, practices, and they have achieved a uh, lot of good things uh, with those things. So the traditional QA engineer's role has changed. And uh, which created us, which gave, gave us uh, a lot of good uh, things where we can you know, observe and learn from those things. 
So this is a small uh, basic uh, way of deployment pipeline. Then I would like to you know, show a little bit of a uh, more advanced one. You might not be able to see the entire thing here. But uh, as, 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 the, as the previous one, the same stage should happen, commit and compile unit test and all those things should happen. And then the QA environment provisioning should happen. Or in QA environment configuration should happen. So that needs to happen using infrastructure as a code uh, methodologies. If you run a puppet service, if you have a puppet service integrated to your uh, software repository, you can have the server configuration in the software repository itself as a configuration. And when you want to uh, uh, deploy your new software into a new environment, you can get that configuration from the puppet and from the uh, software repository. And using a puppet, you can create a new server, automatically provision a server. And then you, once you pro automatically provision the so server, you can automatically deploy the code there. Like in the many, any, any stage here, that you can, you know, uh, uh, you can deploy the code as well as you can automatically provision the server. So it's all about automatically provisioning the hardware, if I am to be very correct, uh, automatically provisioning the servers or the infrastructure, or whether it can be uh, related infrastructure like network, many other infrastructure, load balancing. So automatically provisioning all those infrastructure, and then automatically deploying the code there, and automatically running the test. So it's, everything is in, done in an automated way, which, is, uh, uh, which, is, uh, will, which will re reduce a lot of time between production deployment and code completion. So the biggest problem that we face is that our code completion, uh, after code completion, we take weeks to deploy it into the production environment. Our releases are like, uh, you know, something to celebrate. Celebrate. When we do, do, do a release, we go to a, we have a party and you know we go, uh, we have after party and we go to have a drink and all that, right? But it's not like in the companies like in Amazon or Facebook or Google. If they are to party after every release, they have to. They have to party three, four times a day because they do releases that uh, frequently, and they are introducing a smaller changes. They are not, uh, you know, bringing all those changes as a bulk and putting into the production environment. Have you ever seen that when you get up in the morning, the Facebook was totally changed than it was yesterday? It's not because they are introducing a smaller changes. So they are they are incrementally adding few re smaller things. But you might be having many questions. For example, uh, if you are a bank, if you are providing systems to bank, in certain regulations are there bank in banks. Banks, you might not be able to smallly, gradually introduce changes every day. There are certain regulations. In such cases also, DevOps has ways to handle it. Uh, I think if I discuss it more, it will be out of uh, the scope of my presentation. But if you have such requirements, just please uh, talk to me after the presentation. I will explain how DevOps can help there. So uh, uh, production uh, environment uh, provisioning, till the production environment provisioning, the entire thing is automated. The benefit here is, in every step, there is a feedback is generated and it's sent to the developer. In the commit stage, the feedback is send to the developer and says if the commit fails uh, and uh, if the build in the build stage if the build fails that the developer will get to know it he will get to know that he, i am having some syntax errors in my uh, code then he'll have to you know uh, fix it and uh, put it again so uh, in uh, static analysis checkers there is a feedback that goes to developer in at automated acceptance testing there is a feedback goes to developer so feedback is as is early early that is very important. In uh, modern software industry, what will happen, in, in, usually in some organizations, what will happen is, uh, especially in Sri Lanka, I have seen that uh, you, ha you are working on some project, and then you create, you build, and you commit all these things, and you create it, and you ask the operation te teams to handle it, put it to the production environment, and then you move to a different project. After two, three weeks, then operation folks are coming back and saying, OK, this is not working in production. Now, by that time, you have moved to a diff totally different uh, uh, project or do totally different feature. That's, that's because this feedback is not generating as early as possible. So in this situation, the feedback is generated very, uh, as early as possible. 
when I commit the code into the software repository, once this automated acceptance tests are running, if it fails, I get to know that my uh, uh, code is not working. It, it doesn't deliver what customer, what business is uh, expecting from me. It won't take months to get it to get the, get that to me because it is automated and it is automatically uh, giving the prep feedback. So that feedback loop is really important. In DevOps, it's all about feedback. Yes, uh, two questions. Uh, one is about uh, we were talking about Facebook. So we may be able to understand small changes, bug fixes, and things like that. But from time to time, they do some major change, like let's say privacy policy changes or something else. So that does not come to the production environment uh, until some time. So how do they handle situation like that from the regular uh, release cycle? The other one is, uh, now in terms of this feedback, so when, when, when things are going okay, uh, it's easier to manage. When there are problems in the feedback, how, how it can be managed? Okay. Thanks for that question. It's really good because uh, I think uh, in that way we can uh, build this conversation rather than I'm talking. So it's really good. I will answer the first question. So uh, uh, in Facebook or any other company where you uh, are d uh, practicing DevOps and if you want to do a bigger change, what they will do is they will decouple the release and deployment. What do you mean by decouple the re release and deployment is uh, if you want to have a full change, we break it down to smaller set of changes. And then we deployed it, those changes until the pre-production environment. We, we, all these changes are gradually, we put, it, put into the uh, pre-production environments, smaller changes. We keep adding those smaller changes. We test all those things, smaller changes. And by the time when we want to introduce the entire set set of changes into the production environment, we are coming up with concepts like feature toggles. Where all, this, all these tests, all these uh, smaller changes have deployed to the production environment. And then once all these changes have piled up, when it create the entire bigger thing, we put release to the customer. Until that, we are not releasing to the entire thing to the customer, but it's, they are in the production deployment pipeline till the staging environment. To do that, Software architects and the software engineers need to really think about how we can modularize these changes. If it is a privacy change in a Facebook, I, uh, to be honest, I don't know how, how I don't know how that specific privacy changes that they have handled. But what I can suggest here is, uh, if it is a privacy change like a big thing, then we can small we can you know uh, divide it into smaller changes, privacy changes for photos or maybe privacy changes to. Uh, uh, status. Likewise, maybe in any, any way, they can you know, divide into smaller, smaller changes, and you can put all those smaller changes in the production pipeline until the pre-production environment, but not put into the production environment. Once everything is done, you can put it in the production environment. We call it feature toggles. So those feature toggles will help you to uh, deploy, help you to release the thing at once, and uh, uh, it will help you to decouple the releases and deployments. So that is one thing. Uh, I believe I, uh, if, if you have further questions, we'll discuss it too. And uh, the other factor that you are asking is, the continuous feedback is really important. Why it is uh, continuous feed, when we have problems, why we, are, why we cannot uh, face the feedback, why we cannot, why we cannot face that, and why, can, why we cannot reco re recorrect those things is, our organizations are not ready to, f have not set up to ready, the, uh, no, not set up to accept those feedbacks because our we have given set of user stories within our uh, within our iteration so if a feedback comes in we don't have no room to get it but we should design in our scrums and in our uh, uh, practices we should have some room to get that feedback in and give some time to uh, we allocate some time to react to that Otherwise, what will happen is this feedback, if we are not fixing the feedback as early as possible, once it is going to the production environment, sometimes customers might be able to live with it. We might be able to, when customers are trying to live with it, we put it to our backlog and we call it technical debt. 
the, this technical debt is increasing every time. Uh, after two, three years, the technical de debt has created a huge disaster to the entire environment, and we need to re we had to refact we will have to refactor the entire code. We should not go into that de uh, level. What we should do is every time a feedback generates, we should have room, we should have time in our uh, uh, in our uh, time. We should uh, allocate time, and then we should react to the feedback immediately. If you have time to react to the, uh, if, if the, the software developer has given the time to react to feedback, then the problem will be solved. So that's why I am saying this implementation of DevOps needs to have executive buy-in. As an organization, we should pull, push this uh, uh, DevOps practices down, down to the organization. So for example, then the engineers will have the liberty to react to the feedback. So uh, what, what I personally believe is, in, in our organization, in Pearson also, uh, we are not really uh, releasing the known defects. We are, we, if the no defect is known to us, we are immediately fixing it. Otherwise, it will create the uh, technical debt and uh, finally we will be end up in refactoring, which will cost us a long, much more time than the initial time. I believe, yeah, thank you very much for that question. Then uh, I will go to the next slide. Uh, I think my uh, timer is actually, uh, I have another, another 20 minutes time. Uh, so uh, I will be uh, discussing on engineering best practices on uh, DevOps. First one is develop on uh, main line. If you take Google, 15,000 developers who are working in the Google Docs and related services like Google Spreadsheets and all that, there are about 15 to 20,000 people who are working in uh, Google Docs. In one of their presentations that they have mentioned, that everybody is checking into the main line. They do not have so many branches for so different, different features. What, uh, you, usually what we practice to do is we have branches for everything. If it is a new feature, we have a branch. And if it is a new uh, uh, performance fix, we have a new branch. Likewise, we are branching this software repository into many uh, branches, which is not a good press, uh, thing. We should develop on main line. Whenever you uh, want to do a release, you can have a separate branch for that specific release only. So which is very important. And this is kind of a controversial statement. I believe that you might be having many questions on this first uh, line which I'm talking about. We will, uh, we will discuss it uh, uh, more. And the second one is build your binaries once. Why we want to build your binaries once is, typically we have a syndrome call, uh, it works on my machine. When something goes wrong, production, environment something goes wrong, the developer and said, it worked on my machine, I'm fine, it's your problem now. This, why this happened is, sometimes we build several times in our pipeline for different re environments. When you are doing a production release, we are building it again from the scratch and we put it, use that new build to the, do the production environment, which is wrong. We should have a one build that can be deployed into any environment. Then you might ask me, then how, come we, how can we handle the environment specific variables? If let's say a URL name, how can you handle it? Then you have to isolate the configuration from the software code. If the configuration is isolated, then you can get the same build and different configuration files for different environment. You can have one build and a staging configuration file that we put it to the staging box. And the same build with the production configuration file, we put it to the production environment. So there, the, you, it works. My sin, uh, machine syndrome will, uh, you know, will be not, will be not there anymore. So uh, only build your binaries once, which is very important, and then uh, deploy the same way to every environment. That is also one thing, because uh, when you are deploying to production in a different way and the staging in another different way, it is uh, it is giving us a lot of uh, problems, right? So uh, we should deploy develop, deploy in same way. And also, we should smoke test your deployments. When you, when you do a deployment, if, the, if you can come up with a small test to uh, check whether the application is up and running, kind of a small test, then it will save a lot of time uh, in acceptance test area. Because in acceptance test, when you automate the acceptance test, it will run about two, three hours, right? Or maybe five, six hours. When this acceptance test is automatically running, after five, six hours only that you will get to know that your deployment is not working. Perhaps it may be because that the deployment, after the deployment, the server has not started, right? So because of that, 
smoke testing the deployment is really important. Just a small test where to, to see whether this code is deployed and whether the service is up and running. And then deploy into a copy of production, which is very important and one of the very good practices. I'm, I'm emphasizing the need of the copy of production. In our environment, in, in traditional software development, production environment is totally different from development environments, OQA environment. We do not have same configuration across all the environments. Uh, this production was managed by, is usually managed by sysadmins, which they claim to be kind of a very uh, a, a high privileged folks, that they are doing all sorts of changes into this production environment, but those changes are not depicting in the pre-production environments. Then when you test thoroughly in your environment, stage pre-production environments, your code works. But when you put it to the production environment, it doesn't work. Because the production environment and these environments are not identical. So can a human make this identical in manual way? No, you cannot. Let's say if a server, in a server, if you take the CCTL command, thousands of configurations are there in a server that will change the values of the of this uh, how server is behaving. So it's it's really hard in a production environment, uh, 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 manually uh, manually creating identical environments. So you cannot create manually, you cannot create identical environments manually. That's why you need to have infrastructure as a code. You need to put all the configurations values of a server in a one configuration file, and that using that template, you will need to create many servers. With that template, you can create your staging servers, you can create your uh, production servers. It's just changing the DNS and few other uh, values only. You will be uh, the environment uh, will be identical. U limit, let's say U limit in a server. If the U limit is identical, will be identical uh, across all the environment. If you are using the infrastructure as a code. So the other one is uh, each change should propagate through the pipeline instantly. Every commit should go through the pipeline. If de ideally, a developer should commit once, if once in a day, and that commit should go to the pipeline instantly. And it will go through all those process. And uh, let's say if, let's say if one uh, commit is traversing through the pipeline, and then somebody else is committing, then the other guy can wait until this one is completed. And then by the time another guy commits, then we can create the we can put the latest commit to the production environment. That doesn't matter. You know, to have, so you don't need to have all the commits, but the latest commits definitely should go to the go through the pipeline to its uh, desired state. So uh, if any part of the pipeline fails, we should stop the line and immediately roll back everything, and then we should uh, try to fix it. So when there are commit, uh, when there are commit uh, conflicts happen, we should build a culture where these developers get together and sit together and f f finalize this and come up with the proper, proper commit, which is why we need to have a culture developed within an organization uh, that uh, where we can have organization where we work close, very closely. If the commit conflicts happens, then we can resolve it within the engineers itself. So in this environment, breaking the build is not a crime. But if the proper test is not in place to track it, then it's a crime. So uh, I think I talk a little bit about uh, engineering best practices on this one. And uh, next, I would like to talk about a few infrastructure uh, management uh, principles here. So uh, I've th talked about this in my presentation, but just mentioning here, the desired state of your infrastructure should be spe specified through version control configuration. As I said, server is now a code. That code needs to be installed or code needs to be uh, stored in a software repository. So that code, that configuration needs to fetch, we need to fetch from that uh, repository and we need to come, come up with a set of servers uh, so that uh, you know, we will be having identical servers in many environments. And the other one is infrastructure should be autonomic. That is, it should correct itself to the desired state automatically. Let's say if a developer, is, if, the production, uh, is, if a sysadmin goes to the production environment and change a value in the server, automatically it should correct it to the desired state. How we can do is tools, configuration management tools like Puppet, Chef, Puppet, uh, Chef Salt, CF Engine, Ansible. Those tools are capable of doing it. 
those tools can automatically correct the cha values, value changes. If, if we are introducing a change to a server, server configuration, let's say U limit change, if you are introducing, we should introduce in this same pipeline. We should change that value in our infrastructure as a code file, and then we should implement in the pre-production environment, and we should do all sort of all those tests. And once it is confirmed, only that we should do it in the production environment. You cannot just go into the production environment and uh, do a change and see if it works. No, it doesn't work. We cannot do that like that. So that is not a good way of handling things. So infrastructure should be should be auto autonomic and it should correct itself to its desired state automatically. And then uh, you should always know the actual state of your infrastructure through instrumentation and monitoring. Instrument instrumentation and monitoring is really important, whether it can be CPU, memory, disk space, uh, network bandwidth, whatever it is, everything needs to be properly monitored. And we should react to any changes that are happening to that infrastructure. Let's say a disk filling, disk is filling 100%. That is a change to the environment. We should be able to immediately react to that change. If we have proper monitoring and instrumentation in place, we can do that. So infrastructure management is really important in a DevOps world. So the entire, my entire session is you know, about uh, continuous delivery and DevOps, which is a very broader topic. Uh, I'm having really difficulties in uh, you know, explaining everything in this domain. So I thought of you know, bringing most valuable concepts here. If you have further questions, we can talk about it more. And then uh, next, tools and technologies. So tools and technologies which are mainly in DevOps are version control and artifact repositories. You might have worked with SVN, GitLab, uh, or in uh, IBM they have a new, uh, they have a software repository called ClearCase, which is really good, and they are coming up with a stream-based uh, uh, software development rather than branching. So rather than branches, they have a new concept called stream, which is really good. So there are so many version control systems. As a DevOps engineer, the DevOps engineer should be capable of identifying the costs, pros and cons of all these, many of the major, of the, uh, major software version control systems and then use the uh, best one appropriate. And CI, CD tools like Jenkins, TeamCity, Bamboo, and Go. I personally like Go because it has a, a very good way of uh, uh, you know, showing this uh, in a dashboard, in a di pipeline, you can see the pipeline, how it behaves in a dashboard. Then any de developer in his uh, desk can see if you have a screen over there that my commit is now at this uh, acceptance test level. So he can see that, So the, which, is, which is really good. And static analysis checkers and uh, automated test frameworks, really important. Now the, we are moving into you know, acceptance test driven development methodologies. So automated test frameworks are really important here. And also security scanning tools. If you are building systems for banks or any other financial organizations, the security is a must. So all the security test needs to be integrated into the pipeline. So there are tools to do that for the security scanning as well. Uh, and then uh, automated release deployment tools as well. People are coming up with different uh, tools uh, for their own needs, but there are some standard tools as well. If you take a factor, uh, Factor is a really good tool. You can orchestrate all these steps using Factor. And configuration management tools, I was talking about many times on this one, Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, Salt, Ansible. So those are really good technologies in this one. And containerization and virtualization technologies. I, was, I heard, I, 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 uh, I heard uh, Janaka was talking about containerization technologies. I think he was talking about Docker. I believe, uh, but anyway, this containerization and virtualization is uh, a really good way of handling things because then you can uh, you can uh, come up with a server or come up with a container where you can install all the software, all the software which you created in that container, and you can pu push that same container to the production environment itself. So nothing will be changed. The underlying infrastructure configuration changes, uh, differences will be not there because we are moving the entire set to the production environment as a container. And uh, stru uh, structured storage text file formats like JSON, YAML is also needed. So there, it's, it's a wide spectrum of tools and technologies. I, I thought of it, thought it, it's worth mentioning here. 
and then uh, finally DevOps engineer. I just want, I got a request to you know, talk about a little bit about our DevOps engineer as well. In Sri Lanka, we have, uh, uh, we do not have a lot of uh, DevOps engineers. So I did not introduce myself at the initially uh, at the presentation. So I just wanted to introduce uh, in this slide about myself. I'm, uh, it's which, which is usually, un, which is not usual, but uh, I was, I'm, uh, Application Engineering Manager for Asia Pacific Region and uh, EMEA Region. I manage two teams in both the regions. Uh, both uh, the, both these teams are both these teams are having a set of uh, DevOps engineers. About uh, 40 engineers that I manage across these regions, and uh, I have been working with uh, DevOps for the last uh, three and a half months, uh, three 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 to four years, I believe. Last three to four years, I've been working in DevOps as well as uh, I do consultancy work for many organizations in Sri Lanka as well. So, so I wanted to you know create an awareness on the DevOps engineer role in Sri Lanka. In uh, if you take uh, in Google, Facebook, they are the highly paid engineers than developers and uh, than uh, traditional operation folks. In Sri Lanka, we have uh, we still do not have a lot of DevOps engineers who are capable of uh, you know building DevOps uh, uh, pipelines. So software engineering skill is a very important thing for a DevOps engineer. Traditional, if you are a traditional sysadmin that you haven't uh, done any software engineering and you hate software engineering, I'm sorry to say that your world will be changed very soon because you will have to move to software engineering uh, world. The software is eating, software is actually eating the operations world. So if you want to become a DevOps engineer, software engineering and scripting skill is really mandatory. And uh, infrastructure as a service, uh, platform as a service, software as a service skills are really important. And also testing skills. In traditional sysadmins, the testing is not, was, was not there uh, for uh, traditional sysadmins. They introduce many changes to the production environment without testing, so it is not there. And strong communication skills and vast sysadmin knowledge is also there, should be there. So if you take, uh, uh, in 2013, uh, in left side, uh, you can see that 44% uh, of the engineers were doing uh, hardware and 38% of the engineers were doing, uh, uh, 30, in 44% of the engineers were doing hardware in 2013. But uh, now things have changed. Now it's, you know, uh, the difference is minimized. Now we have engineers who are doing both. Because uh, software and hardware is now becoming uh, one thing with the concepts like uh, infrastructure as a code and uh, tools like uh, Docker and all that. So I have, uh, according to this, I have another five minutes because we might because that because we might have started a little late. Uh, I'm not going to you know discuss any of these things. If you have any questions, uh, please ask me now. So now <coughs> you say that every production source should, should be duplicated the UAT and the staging. So there might be a cost. You know, say we can have the same RAM and all the other hardware component of the UAT and the, the staging cell. So what is the solution? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe the one thing is if you are running on a cloud, the solution is there because in a cloud environment, you can spin up a server whenever you want and you can shut down the server. So if it is a cloud environment, the cost is not a big aspect. When you want to you know, spin up an environment for the new commit, you can spin, up, spin it up and you can do the testing and then you can shut it down. But if it is a traditional environment, traditional data center environments, which is very hard, then if it is virtualized, then, then in the virtualized environment, we can come up with our own scripts by we can come up with own scripts to talk to the APIs in the virtualization environment to automatically spin up the servers. That is a one way of handling things. Uh, so that you know, we, whenever we need to have a, uh, we can have a pool of hardware, and then we we will come spin up a server for that pool uh, out of that pool for the specific test, and we shut it down again. Because the configuration is anyway they are in the configuration file. It's just a matter of getting that configuration file into the virtualization environment and automatically spin up a server. But the other way of handling this problem is uh, you can uh, have scaled down environment. Unless, it is not, unless you are doing performance testing for acceptance test or any other test, you can have a scaled down environment where you might not have the same memory, same RAM, but the configuration should be uh, 
uh, scaled down version, not a totally different version. Let's say the U limit if in the U, uh, main environment, if the U limit is uh, 10,000, the second server, in the pre-production server, the U limit should be scaled down pro proportionally to meet that requirement. So in that way, we can achieve some, uh, something somewhat better. But ideally, only for performance environments that we should have identical environments that you can come uh, sp automatically spin up and you sh shut it down once it is done. But for any other acceptance, QA and any other testing, you can have a scaled down version. Yeah. Yeah, in, in this, in this uh, testing pipeline, uh, what about uh, external services, uh, databases? How, how do you manage changes across those? Yes, uh, which is a very good question. Uh, let's say in this deployment pipeline, there are four components that comprising a, a, a software. Executable code, configuration, host environment, and data. So there are four items. All these four items need to be version controlled. So uh, if it is a database related change, that change all, database also in a modern, in a cloud environment, if you take, if you take uh, databases like NoSQL, Mongo, NoSQL database, Mongo Cassandra, those database, you can, you can, you can, you know, configuration can be versionized. But in a more traditional software, so databases like Oracle, it might be a little hard. Yet, you'll ha we'll have to come up with a ways to put those configuration files into our software repository. And whenever we want to make that changes, we make that changes in the configuration file, and then we deploy that configuration change. But in your questions more broadly, if it is something uh, kind of a patch upgrade, a patch upgrade in a database might not be, uh, cannot go, we cannot put it into the so version control, but we'll have to do all the te testing and uh, in different environments and then do the production environment. They are also, if you do a new patch upgrade, you need to do the acceptance testing. You might have not changed anything uh, in the code, but you have applied a new patch. Then the acceptance test suit automatically should run. Then we are very confident about our environment, then we put it to the production environment as well. So any data changes also there should be there. And we should come up with the mechanisms to create test data as well. That also need to be automated. Creating test data. Yeah. So any, if, you, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, I'm in LinkedIn, my name is Sanjeev Valvis. Uh, if you can search, uh, you will find it there. And uh, if you have any questions regarding this DevOps continuous delivery space, please reach out to me at any point. I'll be more than willing to help. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for your time.